The Sony a7R5 is an insane camera, but it is still possible to get terrible results if you don't understand the quirks and how to use this camera. Let's go over my 10 tips to get the best results out of the Sony a7R5. Hey there, I'm Keith, and if you don't know me, I'm a videographer and designer from Cleveland, Ohio. If you like those things, feel free to check out some of my other videos after this one. First up, if you're going to be shooting 8K footage with the Sony a7R5, realize there are some limitations there. You're only able to record in 24p, the footage is 10-bit, but it's 420, and you're unable to export 8K RAW out of this camera, even if you have the Ninja 5 Plus. The Ninja 5 Plus can export 4K 60 out of this camera, but if you have the regular Ninja 5, you're stuck to 4K 30. One pro for the 8K footage is obviously the crazy resolution that comes along with 8K, and you can use the 8K and a 4K timeline and really have a lot of cropping and zooming latitude and not lose any resolution. Moving on to the photos, I haven't been able to see a difference between the compressed and uncompressed RAWs when editing the images in Lightroom coming off of the a7R5. Here are the file size differences between a RAW photo at the different compressions. Knock on wood, I haven't messed up any images that require me to go to the high end of the shadows or highlights to recover anything. I'm pretty good at capturing what I want the image to look like in camera and then tweaking the details in post. When it comes to storing these giant files coming off of the a7R5, using the correct memory cards is going to be very important, but it will actually vary on what kind of footage and photos you're shooting. If you're shooting uncompressed RAW plus JPEGs, you'll need at least a V60 card. And if you shoot photos very quickly, you'll want to make sure you have at least a V90 card. The best card would be that CF Express Type A uh, for shooting lots of RAW uncompressed burst photos and having the transfer speeds to take all of those images off the card and to your computer will be much faster with those cards. However, they are insanely expensive when you price them next to V60 cards or even V90 cards. If you can afford them, that's great, but don't feel like you have to buy them and make sure you're looking at what you're shooting to what the best bang for your buck memory card would be for your camera. At least I would say get one V90 card and one V60 card. I would stay away from V30 cards even though you could technically use them, it's going to be slower for your camera and your computer to both read and write to. For video, it's a little more black and white depending on what kind of codec you'll be shooting. Here's a graphic along with the speeds of the SD cards or CF Express cards, and you can pause this and see which cards you need based on what footage you're shooting. Faster cards are more expensive, however, they allow you to unlock the true potential of this camera, and you can transfer all of this stuff faster to your computer as well. The autofocus in the Sony a7R5 is one of those features that really sets this camera apart. The autofocus locks onto subjects with very precise eye and subject tracking, but you can select different subjects as well. You can configure the autofocus to detect human, animal, bird, insect, car, train, or airplanes in the subject recognition menu setting. I've used human for almost all of my photos and videos, but I did flip this into animal and it did lock onto my dog's eye very quickly. And when she moved her head, it actually went to the face detect autofocus. And when she turned back to see her eyes, it locked back to the eye focus as soon as she turned her head. But this could be a little bit frustrating if you go between lots of different subject recognition um, features at the same time, because I flipped it into human and I had it pointed at my dog and it did not recognize her at all. And the autofocus actually went to the background. If you'll be flipping between these, I would definitely map this subject recognition to a custom button so you can quickly know which subject you're actually autofocusing on. My fifth tip for the Sony a7R5 is to turn on the anti-dust function. This will have your camera avoid getting any dust on the sensor because your shutter will slide down whenever the camera is off. And uh, whenever your camera is off, that's when you're doing your lens changes. And that's when you can potentially get some dust on your camera. I'm just nervous having it open and talking and not switching a lens. That being said, having the shutter slide down in front of your sensor isn't just a get out of jail free card to get dust into your camera. The shutter still has to slide out of the way and when you're shooting photos in mechanical mode, it actually still slides down and the shutter actually does do a lot of work. So that's not a get out of jail free card to just be you know negligent with your camera when you're doing lens changes. It's just another layer of security between you and your sensor. To turn this on, go to menu, setup option, and anti-dust function. Now when your camera is off, 
your shutter will slide in front of your sensor to protect it. I know we all knew that about the sensor shutter, but I just wanted to say it just to be sure. And if you're enjoying this video, make sure to give it a like just to help with the YouTube algorithm. It really does help. Thank you. My next tip for the A7R5 is to be aware of the crops when filming with this camera. The 4K60 and 4K24 has a 1.24 times crop. The active stabilization has a 1.1 times crop and the focus breathing compensation, if you have a compatible lens, will crop in more based on what lens you have. So if you're just using all of those features, you may not know you're actually cropping in because I don't think the camera really tells you whenever you flip one of these on, it just changes the field of view a little bit. So whenever you're using these features, be sure to know how much cropping you're actually getting into. This isn't the end of the world, but this is more something to just keep in mind. My next tip also has to do with cropping in on the image, but maybe this is cropping that you want to be doing. Clear image zoom is a great way to get extra reach out of your lenses without losing any quality. I loved using this when I was using my 100 to 400 to shoot a photo of the moon. I wasn't able to fill the frame with the moon, but I was able to get some more reach out of my lens when I switched to clear image zoom and I still had 4K resolution in my camera. I'd recommend setting this to a custom button. For this, I use the directional button on the back right here. Uh, to do this, go to Setup, Operation Customize, Zoom, and select Clear Image Zoom. Then to use this, you'll want to make sure you're in the menu again, selecting Zoom, and the Zoom method will be Clear Image Zoom instead of Optical. If we don't do this and we try to zoom in the back of our camera, we'll actually get an error that says we're not able to zoom, even though we just set up this button to be Clear Image Zoom. So if you're getting that error, that's how to fix it. My next tip for the Sony a7R5 is to know when to use silent electronic shutter and when to use mechanical shutter. I was shooting with an external flash on the top of my camera and it wasn't remotely triggering my flashes because I was in silent shutter. I had to switch over to mechanical shutter and then my external flashes would actually trigger. That was a more common one because I actually got an error on the back of my camera that told me I wasn't able to use external flashes when using silent mode. But some things that aren't as obvious is that if you are using silent mode and you're shooting photos of fast moving objects, it'll almost look like you have rolling shutter like in video. So there will be some distortion to them if you're shooting very fast moving objects. Another weird quirk is that certain kinds of lower quality lights will have those scan lines in them when you're using silent electronic shutter. Because even though the shutter may be faster or slower if you adjust it, the sensor readout in silent electronic shutter is slower than when you're in mechanical shutter. So even if you're at the top end and you're still adjusting the shutter speed higher and higher in electronic mode, it may not matter and you may have to switch over to mechanical. I know there's a lot of situations, especially weddings, where silent is great, but you can't choose the lights in the venue. And a lot of time in a venues, they're just whatever lights they have laying around. So they're maybe not even matching color temperatures or quality. So make sure, uh, you know, it might be a little bit louder, but I always like to do mechanical shutter when I'm shooting something that I can't miss. Most of the time, I default to using the mechanical shutter even with that sound. Another thing to consider is you'll have about two to three less frames per second if you're shooting electronic versus mechanical. My next tip is going to try to save you some time when you're using the Sony Imaging app. I try to use this whenever I'm shooting my thumbnails uh, for my channel since I don't have to go up and walk around and shoot, take the photo, wait 10 seconds and then run behind the camera and do whatever I need to do. Sometimes, however, I do like to grab quick video clips too. And this might be a bug, but whenever you go to swap from photo to video mode and your live feed is still on your phone using the app, it won't flip over to the next feed even if you switch the mode on your camera. So what you have to do is if you're in photo mode and you wanna to go to video, shut the app down and close it, turn the camera off, turn the camera to video mode, turn the camera on and then start the app up again. You have to like shut everything down and turn it on in that right sequence and it'll work and you can reconnect pretty quickly. This is a pain in the butt and it might be a bug that I hope gets fixed in the future. This camera actually connects very quickly to your smartphone compared to uh, my Sony a7 III was a nightmare. It always had like timeout errors and half the time it would work. I would take a picture and then it would stop working and then I just had to do all this configuration again. The Sony Imaging Edge app uh, or whatever they just renamed it actually reconnects to the camera very quickly. So 
Even if you have to shut everything down and turn it back on, it's still actually faster than the old A7 III connected to the app the first time. So that is a pain, I hope it gets fixed, but it's really not that big of a deal if you do it in the right order. My 10th tip for the Sony a7R5 is to not be afraid to lean into the stabilization of this camera. Everyone can picture how this translates into everyday photos and videos, but I did notice this allowed me to have longer shutter speeds when I was hand holding this camera in low light situations. I was able to drop my shutter speed down to below my focal length, which typically I do not do that at all. So on a 50 millimeter, I was actually able to go under a 1 50th of a second shutter speed. And I was able to get sharp results still with the stabilization on this camera. That's nice because I am completely spoiled by my other Sony cameras when it comes to low light. This camera isn't as good as the FX3 or FX6 or the A7S III in low light, but those are specifically great cameras for low light but this camera isn't quite as good, but with the better stabilization, you can actually lower the shutter speed and get good low light performance and not have blurry photos and videos. As long as there's not a lot of movement in your photo, you can actually handhold and get great low light results with this camera. As a bonus, keep in mind the base ISOs when filming an S-Log3. This jump isn't as great as filming with other cameras, but the second base ISO will help you get cleaner footage in low light situations. The dual base ISOs for the Sony a7R5 are 800 and 2500 when filming an S-Log3. If you like these 11 tips and tricks for the Sony a7R5, make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and check out this video I made for the six month review of the Sony a7R5. It's not a super spec driven video, but it's more along the lines of what I like and dislike about this camera after using it for six months. Thank you guys for sticking around to the end, and I'll see you in the next one.